Welcome again, Suburban viewers, to another edition of the Suburban On Air and my podcast, Beyond the Pages, which takes an inside look at some of the stories that affect you in your everyday lives. I'm Beryl Wiseman, editor of the Suburban, and it's a true pleasure today to have a very special guest. Senator Tony Lafreda is a member of the Senate Committee on National Finance, and he's just gone through a series of interviews all over the country on that committee's report. And a lot of you may not know, but the Senate really does important work on money. It did it in bank reform. Uh, all money bills originate in the Senate. And a lot of this crisis is about money. And full disclosure, Senator Lafred is a dear friend. He was a great corporate citizen when he was vice chair of RBC Private Wealth. And he's continuing that tradition as a senator and one of the best public servants Canada has. Hello, Tony. How are you? Good morning, oh, Beryl. Always a pleasure. I'll always a you. pleasure to see. Always, always a pleasure to see you and uh, and uh, be with you this morning. Thank you. Uh, the committee's report has gained a lot of uh, attention uh, for two areas, and I know you want to talk about a lot of other areas in the report in in, in, in six or seven points. But I I have to uh, I just address our viewers' interests. And those two areas are that Canada has to start considering a minimum national income. And secondly, the, city, the seating of parliament so that there is more, as you said, uh, agility in the response to numbers. Now, just for our viewers to know, the, the idea of a minimum national income is not new. It was first suggested by Milton Friedman in the early 60s, a free, the father of free market economics, because he felt it's a more humane way of doing things and it's more efficient. And the idea was to blend social security and welfare. We have the money in the system. We cut the bureaucrats and give it up on a needs basis as sort of a top off. So if a country says, for example, like Canada, 23 and a half thousand is the poverty line and somebody's only getting 14 and a half, which is the maximum seniors can get, we top them off. It was almost past the United States. We tried the experiment in 76 to 79 under the Pierre Trudeau government in Dauphin, Manitoba where many people thought, well, if we just give out a guaranteed income or a minimum national income, less people will work and no, there won't be incentive. And quite the contrary was found. Health costs went down because people were working calmly. They weren't worried as much. And more people went to work. And right now, a major proponent of the minimum national income before the Senate committees studied it was former uh, progressive conservative Senator Hugh Siegel, uh, former Montrealer. So, Senator Lafreda, uh, I'm going to switch between Senator and Tony because... Uh, you can call me Tony. Everybody knows me as Tony. That's fine. And uh, I'm proud uh, to be a senator. And, uh, let's talk for a couple call. of minutes about the committee's concept of a minimal annual income. Is it, as I suggested, the Friedman model of popping off between a certain level and at least where the poverty line is? Uh, or is it something else? Well, there's... Well, first of all, I... Uh, Thank you once again. Many people don't know that talking about Senate committees, uh, Senate committees are referred to uh, by tribunals and Supreme Court judges seven times more than any other committee work from the government. So it's very important. A lot of talk has gone into this committee work, uh, into our National Finance Committee, and I'm proud to be one of the spokespersons and uh, share our recommendations. And um, Talking about it, and I, and I feel, and I feel like talking about finance. I feel like, uh, how can I say? I admired Zaza Gabor, who died at 99, and rest in peace. But I feel like her ninth husband. Where I know it's required, but how do I make this interesting? Uh, let me start by saying, by quoting Mahama, Mahatma Gandhi, by saying, "The true measure of any society can be found in how it treats." It's most vulnerable. So universal basic income, what we're recommending, there has to be a thought process. The government has to consider it. There has to be a deep dive into the numbers. Uh, some numbers were looked at, uh, and we're talking about for six months, close to $100 billion. If we look at the government expense budget for annually, it's close to $330 billion. We're talking about universal basic income or livable income for six months at all close to $100 billion. So, so there's different structures, there's different models that have to be looked at. I think it's way too early at this point to say this is the model that's going to work. 
this is the model we are recommending, or this is the model that should be, we, should, we should focus on going forward. So I think there's many different models. What we are recommending is let's take a deep dive, let's consider it. Now, many people, I've done many interviews across the country, and I wanna make this interesting. Uh, one of the interviewers asked me, he says, how does, let, let me understand, Senator Lofeda, how does an executive vice chairman of RBC, former executive vice chairman of RBC, believe in universal basic income? I mean, you're not a left-leaning socialist. Everybody knows where I come from. Even though, although, and I'll talk about immigration and my dad, don't let me forget that. Although we did start there, and we worked all the way, and, and, and such a wealth to have seen the whole cycle from poverty, where we did start from poverty, all the way to where I did end up. Let me say that since the Second World War, if we take the return on capital, the return on capital and the return on labor, there's a huge gap. And in order for societies to function well, democracies to function well, and we talk a lot about the middle class, but we have to take care of our middle class. We have to have everybody believe they can get to the middle class. They can aspire to being a middle class citizen, if not more. And, and it's important. I think universal basic income, if we look, you know, takes care of poverty, takes care of financial health, takes care of educational possibilities going forward. Many, many, the list is long. And I think it's there, it's time that it must be considered. Now, being a CPA by profession, there is a cost to it. There has to be some sustainability going forward. And this is why today I don't want to get into the different business models without having taken a deep dive into those models and saying, here's the cost, here's what it will cost for six months, 12 months, here's how, there's cost savings. I mean, I talked about 100 billion for six months. When, when there's you, cost savings, when there's you, provincial you, cost savings, welfare and what have you. So, so many different models. Tony, when uh, you talk about six months or 12 months, uh, are, are, is this because what's being discussed is a pilot project or is this six month uh, what, what might be necessary? And just my last question on this, and you can answer both at the same time, is there a particular, just as the COVID has hit seniors so, so terribly, uh, seniors are in a particularly vulnerable economic position in Canada. We've got the lowest pensions in the G7. 40% of our seniors don't have private pensions or RSPs. Is there a particular priority being given to looking at at least relieving uh, the plight of seniors, again, by rolling the money into, from Social Security and welfare together and popping off, getting them from 14,500, the average of pensions in Canada to at least 23,500, which is the poverty line? Are they going to be made a priority or is this still in the air? Well, well, first of all, let me be precise. On July 7th, 2020, the parliamentary budget officer released a cost estimate at the request of Senator Wu of a basic income. And it's estimated that from October 2020 to March 2021, six month period, a basic income of $16,989 for individuals. I'm reading, I want to get the numbers correct, and $24,027 for couples would cost between $47.5 billion and $98.1 billion. So these are the precise exact numbers. Depending whether the phase out was 50 cents, 25 cents, or 15 cents for each dollar of employment income earned. It's too early barrel to deep dive and say who will be included. The more inclusive, what did I, you know, I've said to the, the different media and uh, many people have asked me, by the way, I, I feel that the government has done a fine job in applying support aid. We have to transition now from support aid to economic stimulus going forward. And we'll get to that. And people have said, and people have said, and, and we can talk a lot about that, but I've used one word and you've seen it, it's agility. So let's, let's try to make it agile, keep that one word agility coming from a big corporation. Agility is always a measure of success. How agile can you be? when you've got numerous policies and numerous procedures. And so agility is so important in putting any program into place. And inclusiveness is important. So the more people are included, the better. The more agile, the better. And many of the government programs have to be progressive. They have to be scalable, not just fixed. Uh, I've discussed that in many different ways. So that is exactly where the numbers come from. And... Um, I think it's something that has to be considered going forward, has to be seriously considered. 
you just use the word agility and let, let's get to that because what you've suggested is part of being agile is obviously being present. And you've suggested that parliament could, should meet more often in whatever fashion, uh, even if it's not the full complement of senators and MPs, but it's gotta be present. How do we get there when there's this atmosphere of fear in the country? Well, I'm not a medical expert. We have to listen to our medical experts. Oh, no, uh, maybe it can't. It, maybe it can't be. No, but maybe it can't be. In there's three ways: either a hybrid model, a full virtual model, and a full virtual model is less costly than a hybrid model. Not to get into those costs. We've discussed those costs. We're looking at those costs at the Senate. But and, there's and like I said. Something. But Tony, there's something about government. If people want to be in government, we discussed this off air. They have to be frontline. People have to see that their leaders are there. Well, well, even not even not the full complement, but at least bring Parliament and the Senate back prorated with the number any number of senators and MPs at any given time. Uh, it's time, isn't it? it the, it's time. Not, it's time. I think the I think the, the 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 perfect model at this point in time, considering the crisis we're in, which, like I said, it's different in scale, it's different in structure, uh, and adhering to safety measures is a hybrid model putting a certain number of senators or members of parliament in chamber or in the House of Commons, and the others being on a hybrid model, being virtual. Uh, it, is, it is costly, but I think if we, as, an, as a CPA, allow me to say, if we amortize that over a number of years, it is well worth the investment. I think we have to debate. Debate is what allows democracy to prosper and to, to, to better itself. I think all regions and voices have to be heard. And I can go on and on about why a full parliament is necessary, but there's oversight. I mean, the Senate, the Senate wants oversight of the expenses coming in. I think there's oversight that has to be done. And oversight is not just a tick and balance and saying, hey, I found you, I got you. And I don't want to put my old auditor hat on. Uh, auditors are auditors. We have auditors. Um, and, and, and no, but oversight is also saying, have we taught about a, B, or C? Have we thought about D, E, or F? Have we thought about how we can get this economy uh, back? And it's going to be a digital economy much more than it was before. Uh, have we thought about getting our small businesses back? Let's debate this. Let's come up with ideas. And I think all governments will benefit from, from doing that. And this government will definitely benefit from doing that. I'm looking forward to, 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 to having, uh, you know, full, full Senate uh, sittings and, um, Virtual is fine. We're virtual this morning. Maybe but, uh, you can't see all my wrinkles, but, but I think is, you hear me well. But there is something about the human contact, that, that friction, that pulse that happens when lawmakers are in a chamber that cannot, that'll never be replaced. That's, that's an important function. It'll never be replaced. But Barrow, but Barrow, we have to, you know, there's, and, and I don't want to blame the government. There is safety measures. No, it's, it's not, not clear. It's, it's not, not a clear. Blaming the government. It's not no. just our government. It's all governments no. are doing this. All governments. I, you know, it's not clear where we want to go. Maybe on an economy, on the economic side, or it, it's not clear. We're, we're in an era where it's, like I said, it's not static. It's dynamic. It's ever, it's changing every day. Uh, one day we hear that, uh, you know, we can catch it by surfaces. Another day, retweet, we can't catch it by services, by surfaces, the virus. Thank, so thank we really don't know, we really don't know where we're going, how we can get it, how we can catch it, keep the safe, you know, social distancing. How do you keep social distancing in the Senate where everybody's sitting next to each other? So I think the hybrid model is a model that we have to consider uh, seriously, and hopefully we can ad adapt to, or adopt a model starting in September that all senators are present, all regions are heard, all voices are there, and we can bring out some great ideas for the government to consider and debate. It's so important. Same with the House of Commons. I think it's, it's important. And I, I, when asked that, I said, I feel it is important. It's essential for any government to function. Now, Tony, uh, Canada, as every country, has spent a lot of money, and we've shut down a lot of commercial capacity. Uh, in, the, in the Depression, we lost 38% of our commercial capacity. The Western world shut down 79% of it during COVID. You, you, you and your colleagues in the committee have looked at what's going to be, what are our possibilities? We can't constantly be in debt. We, like every Western country, has a lot of it. How do we resuscitate things? How do we revive things? Uh, here in Quebec, just yesterday, uh, office towers are constrained 
companies in office towers to only bring back 25% of their staff. Well, the government looked at this and they saw that only 10% were coming back to downtown Montreal, and that's a third of Quebec's GDP. So they made a call to companies to at least bring back up to 25%, and it's going to be difficult. Now, you've got seven words that you like to use to describe the work of the committee in the planning of where do we go from here and how do we restore some normalcy. So I'll give you the floor on that. Sure. Thank you on that. And it's not just on the committee. There's a lot of personal thought that goes into that. Uh, but one, many people talk about, and obviously we're 12 senators that we're part of the National Finance Committee and we all have our own personal ideas and opinions. And it's not opinions that count as much as judgment. Judgment is important. It has to be based on, it has to be factual, it has to be based on true facts, uh, different from an, an opinion. We all have our own judgments. So that's very important. Well, a senator, many Mo people, a senator, Mo as senator Moynihan once said, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Nobody's entitled to their own facts. We get yeah, Exactly, exactly. And that's where judgment comes from, facts. So that's important. So to say that, so our recommendations are based on facts, not opinions, based on judgments, based on we've met over 50 witnesses, had over 50 briefings. I've got a set of words that I like to share, also personal, but a lot of people talking about debt, a lot of people always talk about the $343 billion deficit and the debt level, was it, which is at over a trillion dollars at this point in time. As a banker, allow me to say, it's not the debt level that matters as much as the capacity to repay. It's the capacity to repay. And this not recession- just, not, just to pay, not just to pay the interest, but to repay. To repay, capacity to repay. Not just the interest, capacity to repay. Uh, I mean, we all have personal different debt levels, uh, but maybe someone else's debt level cannot be uh, repaid if, it, if I take that burden, right? Or, or vice versa. So debt, it's debt level is one thing, but capacity to repay is another thing. And I think if we look at Canada before the crisis, we had one of the healthiest economies. And how do we get Canada back to having one of the healthiest economies in the world like we had before the crisis? So th this is the key question. How do we do that? And I put together seven words and, um, you know, one, I, when I, when I, I always start with, uh, with and, and, and the other thing I want to do before getting into the seven words, many people will say, well, what about the Bank of Canada? Uh, yesterday we saw held interest rates steady. This is not a monetary policy recession. The Bank of Canada has done the most it can. It facilitated the uh, fun market functioning. It uh, bought back bonds. It facilitated the government lending. Uh, facilitated government lending. It's, I can go on and on. So the Bank of Canada, kudos, did the maximum it could. I think the aid, the support aid, has been sufficient. Has been well done. Has been fine. We could afford it at this point. We could afford it, and we could repay if our economy goes back to what it was before the crisis. So it's a fiscal policy recession. And what does a fiscal policy recession mean? We need economic stimulus, investments, tax credits, take a look at infrastructure, take a look at developing skills for the post-COVID economy. You just said uh, this is going to be different. How do we develop skills for our workers to transition into the digital economy, for our small businesses to transition into the digital economy? But anyway, I can go on and on what's required. We will look at economic stimulus, our National Finance Committee, in the fall. So I don't want to give away too many points or influence the committee in such a manner saying, well, Senator Lafreda already discussed it way back in July. But there's many things that need to be done on the economic stimulus side. And it's dynamic. So it might change in September. It's dynamic. It might change in September. But take a look at the infra. Take a look at the internet, for example. All Canadians should have access to high-speed internet. There was a budget that was put forward a few years ago. Let's accelerate that budget. Let's help our small, the hardest hit were our small and medium-sized businesses. How do we help our small and medium-sized businesses transition into the digital economy? It's not clear right now. And we can take some long-term planning. Like, for example, everybody talks about deglobalization, uh, populism, uh, more local buying. I think we've learned through this crisis that we're all connected. We are all connected. Now, can China, our relationship with the US, 
could be better, could be better. I think the U.S. has changed. Uh, USA, America first, right? We hear it all the time, USA first. So our relationship has changed. But let's not forget, we are geographically advantaged. We have the, one of the largest markets in the world right next to us. 80, close to 80% of our GDP is import-export. 45% is export. It changes, uh, changes weekly, but three quarters is to the US. So let's not forget that. We have to, we have to really work that relationship, improve it, and keep it as tight as possible. Although today we may say that it, the US to Canada is not the ally it once was. Can China be the new global leader? The, the US economy is still the number one economy in the world, but could China be the new global leader? I think there has to be more transparency. And there's many other things, you know, copying intellectual property is not permitted. There has to be, there has to be certain, certain values. And this is my first word. And a good, uh, uh, I, I, have to ask you, I have to ask you a quick question on your remarks. Uh, first of all, on a personal yes, note, yes. Uh, on a personal note and, and looking things geopolitically, I think if China doesn't fundamentally change, we certainly can't get more reliant on China for a whole variety of reasons. We can't be indebted to them. They're not. They have not shown themselves to be an appropriately transparent partner in many things in this crisis. But I'll leave it at that. But in the, in the, in but, your, but, but, but let me make, let me make a comment. Let, no, me, get, let, let me get back yes. to your comment about, about repayment. So a lot of people out there are worried about repayment means temporary increase in taxes. And of course, people's fears are a, tem a temporary tax is never goes away. Like the income tax was a temporary tax. And number two, they, they're asking exactly who are we repaying this money to? Who are we borrowing from? Well, we would need a whole session to get who we're borrowing from. Okay. And I'll get into Forget quickly the five, the five points, the five points uh, as to how do you repay a deficit or, your, or, or a debt. But first I want to make a comment on China is that I think Canada has shown that we can have constructive dialogue. We were peacekeepers for so long. We can have constructive dialogue globally. And I've talked about, de many people talk about deglobalization. I want to say we need Reglobalization. We need reglobalization. There's talking about China. Look at what they've done in Africa. The Western world has neglected Africa. I mean, if we look at Nigeria, 207 million in population, within the next 30 years, that population will double. I think it's an area we can't, it's long term, obviously, like infrastructure investments, long term, but I think we can make a fairer, more sustainable, better economy going forward. And I think we have to take the long view. The Senate is there to take the long view, not the no. democratic. Sometimes democracy take, take the short view. Now so deficits, there's, there's many ways of repaying deficits, but no, no increase in taxes. We can't increase taxes in this economy. It would be havoc. havoc. We can't increase his taxes. We, we, have heard, we have heard, and I'll drop the tax question after this one, but we have heard that one of the things being considered as a really sort of Hail Mary last ditch effort if we have to continue stimulus, if we have to continue support, is 5% temporary across the board increases each year for three years in the marginal rates. I haven't, I haven't heard that, Beryl. It's the first time I hear that, I'll be honest. And uh, I haven't heard that on Parliament Hill. I haven't heard that uh, Good, I'm in, glad. The Senate, in the Senate. Uh, I think there's four or five ways to repay uh, debt and deficit. One would be an increase in taxes which at this point in time, it's not, not permissible, not recommended. Because that would and, kill the recovery. That would kill the recovery. So we have to, I just said, the recovery, we have to invest, uh, incite our small businesses to get back to work, get their workers back working, get Canadians back working. Investment, we need investment. Wealth is always created by the entrepreneur. Always created by the entrepreneur. And uh, so, so, but you can... Different ways of repaying the deficit is uh, decreasing spending, increasing taxes, inflating the economy is one way. You can inflate the economy. But inflation, you need two things for inflation. Excess liquidity, scarce resources. We don't have one nor the other at this point in time. Uh, or you can grow your private sector. There's a fifth way. Or you can grow your private sector, grow your businesses. So taxes, we can't increase taxes. Cut spending, we're doing the opposite at this point in time, as I said. 
uh, we have to treat our most vulnerable with respect, with the need they need, get the small businesses back working so we can't cut spending. Can we inflate the economy? Inflating the economy, many people ask me, why would inflation work? Well, obviously, if your debt is 1.2 trillion and you inflate the economy and the value of money, your revenues get inflated with the economy, your taxes get inflated without increasing the rate just for your everyday listener. And obviously, your, your debt uh, as a nominal value, as a percentage of your revenues becomes way smaller, so you can inflate. But inflation, there's disadvantages to inflation. No central bank wants inflation because the pension you're earning well, if inflation becomes a factor, your, your value of money, right? Your value of money uh, dissipates. So you can't do that. Or you can grow. The, but there's a fifth way, which I'll talk about, but not in detail because I, I get into, I'm passionate, as you see, and I'll get into detail and then we'll lose, we'll lose everybody be, because of the expertise. And we have to go back to the your expertise. Support. Because growing of the expertise. But, and but, you have but, growing, left. but, but, but growing, growing our private sector, growing our private sector, growing our small business, growing our revenues. That's the solution. That is the solution. How do we get our economy back to where it was? That's the solution. That's what we'll be concentrating on in the Senate, in our National Finance Committee in the fall. What can we recommend to the government? Uh, by, and, and, and like I said, it's judgment, it's facts, by having witnesses, uh, by, by having readings, proceedings, reviews, and coming up with good judgment, great facts. What can we recommend? to really grow our businesses, grow our revenues, repay our debt. There is a fifth way, you can monetize the debt, but I'm not going to get into that. How do you monetize the debt? Because I'll talk about 10 minutes about know, how to know, monetize the debt and, and nobody will understand what, how do we monetize the debt. But there is a way of, of, of doing that. So you've got, quickly, six, you've got six words left. You only did change. Yes, well, one, one, one was values. I mean, uh, you know, you gotta look at values and, Important, integrity is one of the values, never negotiable, uh, accountability, responsibility, diversity. We talked so much about diversity, so much. It's such an important value. I think that society today has to maintain its values. In a crisis, you have to maintain your values. And regardless what situation you're in, I want to share with everybody, let's not forget who we are, where we come from. We're great Canadians. Let's maintain our values. And, uh, you know, and Responsibility, service, service is a value. If I take five key values, integrity, diversity, responsibility, uh, service, I mean, those are, 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 are key values. And, and um, you know, so we have to keep that, keep that. And, and accountability, we have to be accountable. Accountability, we talked about parliament, we talked about, we can go on and on with values, as many values, but let's, let's stick with those keywords and we have to maintain those keywords. So very important to do so. Uh, the second word I wanted to talk about was change. Everybody is contemplating or questioning or will we ever be the same again? Will it go back to what it was? And, and, and this is a game changer. The world will never be the same. And I've read so many uh, emails and, uh, on Facebook also as to uh, 1900. Uh, they were born in 1900 and all the changes they've gone through, world wars and what have you. Well, if I go back... In the 80s, we had hyperinflation. In the 90s, uh, and with hyperinflation, high unemployment, everybody would say the world will never be the same. In the 90s, we had the referendum in Quebec. We had the real estate bubble that burst. We had real estate values diminish. The world will never be the same. And then 2000 was technology and the dot-com bubble burst. The world will never be the same. 2010, all we talked about was indebtedness. Indebtedness, the U.S. indebtedness, which if you lost over $10 million a day since the year 1 AD, you wouldn't be up to the debt level they are today. Uh, we talked about indebtedness in 2010. Well, today it's a virus. I think eventually, slowly, the world always changes. Maybe it doesn't change enough. Maybe we should change more. Let's make it a better, fair, more sustainable economy going forward and a more sustainable world going forward. So let's take advantage of that change. So uh, Beryl, the other words are confidence, acceptance, purpose, education, fun, um, I don't know if you want me to get into them, how much time we have, but, um, well, we've got, about, we've got about five minutes left, five minutes left. So let me cover in five minutes. I, I think we've covered, we've covered value. We've covered change, uh, confidence. I think, I think it's important, uh, you know, that the consumer is the vehicle of every recovery. And the big question is how do we bring back the confidence level in our consumer? 
in our entrepreneurs. How many times have I said, uh, you know, people said, we've heard you say so many times that wealth is always created by the entrepreneur and they will never say it enough. How do we bring the confidence level back into the entrepreneur? The U.S. is one of the biggest economies in the world. If you look at the U.S. before the crisis was 25% of the world's GDP, 70% of that is the U.S. consumer. I'm talking about the U.S. because it's our largest export market. So how do we bring back the confidence into the consumer? Acceptance. I think we have to accept what has gone on. We have to accept change. We have to accept going forward. People always have a difficult time accepting change. Let's accept it. Let's see how we can better our world and move forward from there. Purpose. I think I covered purpose a little bit. I think many people, getting, going back to universal basic income, and, and, and if I can say a word on that, many people question the incentive to work. Listen, my dad started as an immigrant. I was born here. My mom was almost nine months pregnant when, we, when, when they arrived in Canada. I was born. I saw the full picture. From poverty, he used to work at 27 cents a mattress, sewing mattresses, running around the table. Sunday nights, we would count the labor tickets. And I can sense the fear in his eyes uh, when we bought our first home. I was seven. We were living in the basement. I was 14 by the time we moved to the middle, middle floor, the main floor. And by then, hey, we had arrived. We were middle class. My dad thought we were rich, right? Because we can now breathe a little and have some money in the bank. We were far from being rich, but, but I can see what the immigrants go through, why the need is there, and, 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 and what is required to thrive and prosper. So when people ask incentive to work, my dad missed very few days of work, very few days. If he missed one or two, he would go to work sick. He never was on social welfare, never was on unemployment. I think there's purpose. Canadians, I believe in Canadians. Canadians love their jobs. Students love their jobs. Students love their studies. So. It, it, it kind of hurts me when, pe when I hear people say, well, if, we give, if, if you give me a check, do you think I'll stay home and do nothing? Come on. I, I believe in Canadians. I believe in universal basic income. I believe in improving uh, people's health, financial health, mental health, poverty will decrease health costs. Uh, other costs can be decreased. So that was the word purpose. You have to wake up with a purpose and keep going. Education. I think it's important that we as Canadians embark into a lifelong learning process. Our skills have to continuously be tweaked, improved, reskilled. We have to reskill our labor force. How do we how do we get our small and medium-sized businesses to the digital economy? Getting, you know, the other day I wanted to buy coffee capsules, and they say, well, it's five-day delivery. How do we improve that process? How do we improve the process? Because it's going to be a different world. Yes, it all, people have always said, oh, it's a different world improving. I mean, the Amazons of this world, the Googles of this world, the Netflix, a Shopify. I mean, it's, a different, it's different in structure and scale, this recession. So oh, how do sorry, we- Sorry, I'm getting the two-minute mark. I just wanted you to know. Yes, and, the, and you know, so education is key. And last, for the two-minute mark, Last but not least, let's have fun. Let's not forget to stay connected to our communities, uh, stay connected to our families, stay, stay connected with one another, because if we're not having fun, if we're not enjoying the ride, well then it's not worth everything we're putting into it. So I think it covers, it covers pretty much, instead of talking about it, and I have a whole bunch of numbers here and what we looked well, at, that, but I wanted to make it interesting, like I said, like Zaza Gabor's ninth husband. That, how do we, I know what it takes, but how do I make this interesting, right? That, that's, a great, that's a great place to end, Tony, and it's always a pleasure talking to you and your clarity and your honesty and your candor is appreciated by all Canadians, as we appreciated in Montreal for so long. And I'm glad you're in Ottawa. And Thank good you very much. You. Thank you, Beryl, and you're always a great friend. And keep up your great, your great work. Keep, okay. keep fighting, keep your voice out there, and uh, it, it, that's what makes our democracy so much better. We try, and thank you again. Be a cherry to have you, as always. And uh, you'll be on again. On the, there'll be other issues. And I well, thank, thank you. you. Always a pleasure. And I want to thank you, our viewers, again. Well, just welcoming you again to my study that's become a studio. And uh, till the next time. Good day. Alla prossima. Ciao. Alla prossima. Ciao. Mille grazie.